The Falcons and Hawks play, play here. And five. Touchdown, Atlanta. Right to the basket. He jams. Paul Millsap with a slam dunk. Atlanta, thanks for making us your sports station. Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. What we've talked about is playing to our vision the whole year long, what, what we're about. That's being unselfish. That's being disciplined. That's being kind of having a little chip on our shoulder, but a controlled chip on our shoulder. And I think our guys know that because you, you, you're, all the things you want to achieve are all driven by your vision for what that's going to look like. And our guys have done a good job of that. And doing a good enough job to uh, probably earn yourself a two seed in the NIT. Brian Gregory bringing us back here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Matt Holmes with you until uh, 10 o'clock when we hand it over to Hawks basketball. Mike Conti, Dwayne Farrell, the Hawks and the Clippers here on 92.9 The Game. But as we mentioned uh, in the sports flash, yeah, pulling double duty tonight, hosting and uh, flashing here for the next hour. Uh, Georgia Tech with a big upset win over Pittsburgh. Um, what did you just say? I'm sorry. I've got my producer saying inappropriate things in my ear. It's you very said I'm flashing for the next hour, and I said, please keep your clothes on, oh, sir. Well, thank you for that. Yes. Anyway, Deshaun Tate's here. Let's play his opening sounder. This is Tate's Take with Deshaun Tate, featuring NCAA college basketball on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. That's hilarious. I, I, just, I heard somebody in my ear say something about somebody didn't have clothes on. I'm like, wait, what? What's going on? It's about flashing, so I just wanted to let you know, hey, this is a, this is a, an environment, sir. We, we don't encourage that. And we don't ask if you like boys or men or any. That's not our business. We don't ask that question. Deshaun, welcome. I will not ask you if you like men because that would not be right. I certainly hope not. But glad to have you. 92.9thegame.com obviously is the website. All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, we had a marquee matchup here on the game just moments ago. Carolina 76-72 over Duke. The rebounding battle. And I fear this is going to be something that could plague Duke throughout uh, whatever kind of March run they're going to try and put together. 64 to 29 on the boards. No Carolina took them 64 to 29. Obviously, a, a big absence with Emil Jefferson. Yeah, and Emil Jefferson isn't the only reason for the big deficit. I mean, it's not like this is a Duke team that lost Emil Jefferson towards the tail end of the season, and they've had some opportunities to make adjustments and things of that nature. So it's just about Carolina being hungry, and I don't think that this is, you know, the end of Carolina's Carolina's hunger. I think that this is going to carry over to the ACC tournament, and it just happens to be that um, Duke was the very first victim of that hunger. Well, it's interesting. Roy Williams said before the game, if and when they beat Duke tonight, they're not going to go in the locker room and celebrate beating Duke. He's going to hammer home. We want to win a championship. It is not about Duke. Well, I certainly hope not because, you know, that that being a team that they – in-state rival, they haven't beat them in close to about three years or something like that. So, it, it's if you're Carolina, that's a team that you're supposed to be beating, especially with the team that Duke has and the injuries and they just don't have the exact star power that they're used to having and the star power they do have is maybe not as talented as the ones they did have last year, which are automatic first-rounders. And stuff like that. And Carolina's not a team. I mean, they're a very experienced team. They've lost some players from time to time. But guys like James Michael McAdoo and and Reggie Bullock and, and J.P. Tokido, they weren't missing much. So with that experience, they should be expected to do what they did tonight. I like, not worse. Yeah, I like that Roy Boy is focused in on winning a championship because if the NCAA has any integrity at all whatsoever. Uh, it'll be the last NCAA tournament Carolina plays in for a few years, hopefully. Deshaun Tate joining us here in studio on 92.9 The Game. Um, how far can Duke go? Because it's not just the rebounding that you lose from Emil Jefferson. They were already playing on a tight rotation, six, seven guys at this point. Uh, you got a ton of McDonald's All-Americans on that roster, but Coach K, he's content, he's comfortable with just going with a really short rotation. Foul trouble could be a problem in March. I think it could be in a lot of things, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on whether you're a Blue Devil fan or not. Coach K is going to get, the bottom line is Duke is going to get certain calls. Certain things are just going to go their way, and it's not like they're a horrible team. I mean, they are coached by who you may feel like is one of the more overrated coaches mm -hmm. in the country. But that is true. It, at the end of the day, he is one of the better coaches in all of history of college basketball and the sport. So with that being said, I like to think that they're at least minimum a Sweet 16 team when it comes to the NCAA tournament, assuming that's what you were asking about. Yep. 
um, for the simple fact that it's not ironic to me how Carolina and or Duke typically start out the first weekend in either Greensboro or in Charlotte oh, yeah. or something like that. Nice it's and comfortable. Winston-Salem, the... they're always right yep. in their backyard. I can't even remember the last time they weren't. So given those first two games, then I, I definitely have to say a minimum of Sweet 16 for sure. All right, so in the ACC, uh, you got a lot of really good teams. We're watching a couple of them playing right now with uh, UVA and Louisville. Obviously, Louisville has disqualified themselves. Stop. We have people distracting and dancing in the background. It's inappropriate. Just stop. Anyway, uh, Louisville out of the postseason. But Virginia's very good. Carolina's hot. Duke wants to be something. Which of the teams in the ACC in that upper echelon group do you see that actually could make noise in March Madness? And in this in this ACC tournament that could determine, will determine a number one seed in the NCAAs, uh, who do you like there? I think it'll be Carolina for the simple fact that I think they're hitting on all cylinders and they've got the confidence booster going for themselves right now, especially expecting with a win over a team like Duke. Um, but Virginia is very good defensively. I just don't know exactly what they can do offensively against a team that is just happens to be hitting shots regardless of how well Virginia is playing on the defensive end. And, of course, Miami. Uh, I, I told someone else this the other day, 10 years post the Jim Laranega's run with uh, George with um, George, George Mason, Mason so, yep. yeah, exactly. So, and they've got a, a bunch of six year of uh, uh, six year guys, five year seniors, things like that. So it kind of reminds me of the team when they had Shane Larkin, although he was the young guy. They had a lot of guys that were coming back that season as well. So I think between those three of Virginia, Miami, and Louisville, North Carolina probably has the best shot. And they need it the most, too. So Deshaun Tater, college basketball blogger for 92.9 The Game, joining us in studio. I want to ask you about a couple bubble teams. All right, check out this resume. You're 53rd in the RPI. Uh, you have got a 19-12 and 12 record, 9-9 nine and nine in your conference. But you get five top 50 wins. All right. Um, against the top 50, you're five and eight. Against the top 100, you're, you get eight wins. All right. Impressive resume. I'm talking about Syracuse. 500 in the ACC. I could ask you the same question about Pitt. For me, Pitt and Syracuse, ACC tournament opener. I mean, that's, that is a play in game for the NCAA tournament. I'm not sure if I really like Syracuse to get in for the simple fact of before you even told me it was Syracuse, my very first initial thought was what conference is it that they have those wins in? And you're talking about going in nine and nine against a typical, very good ACC conference. But then again, you automatically add on two pretty much automatic wins for a, a team like BC, right. Boston College, that did that went winless in the conference. And even though they're top heavy, and I know everybody's kind of top heavy in their conference, but yet still everybody's not Duke and Carolina on this list. You still have your, your you know, North Carolina State's Wake Forests and Virginia Techs. There's still those there's still those teams that you're racking up those wins again. We talk so much about quality wins and try to get inside the head of the NCAA selection committee. Mm -hmm. All right, so you got five top 50 wins. You know, you look at what you've done in the past 10, past 12 games, how you're playing at the end of the season. How heavily do they weight bad losses? Because Syracuse has a bad loss at Georgetown. That is a RPI 106 team. They lost to Clemson, RPI 123. They lost at St. John's by 12, and St. John's 232 in the RPI. Is that a deciding factor? I think it has to be a deciding factor because at the end of the day, it's games that were played and they have to be accounted for regardless of who you – well, this isn't just something we're going into and talking about games that they've won. We also have to factor in the games that they've lost. And I get the, the ratings percentage index and the BPI and the strength of schedules, and I'm all good with that stuff. But sometimes I think it, it, there's a little bit too much emphasis being put on it. Sometimes we just have to go off the natural eye and what we see with this team. Is this team worthy? Not capable, but are they worthy of being an NCAA tournament team? And on top of that, take their prestige out of it. Syracuse is typically you know, one of those teams that – that typically makes the NCAA tournament, and people tend to pull for them, but I'm just not a big advocate of that if they haven't put in the work. Gonzaga's gone to about 17 straight NCAA tournaments, I think. They went 15-3 and in their conference this year, 23-7 and overall. Here's the problem. They're 62 in the RPI. They're 62 because against the RPI top 25, 0-2. Against the top 50, they're 1-5. and 3-7 and against the RPI top 100. Situation where Gonzaga's going to win their conference tournament? Absolutely. They have to win their conference tournament. Not only is their back up against the wall, um, 
because of that reason alone of what you stated, but they are also in the West Coast Conference in which before they came upon these struggles, they still were kind of in a position where people kind of questioned them and said when they get to the NCAA tournament, they don't tend to make noise. Now, I know they made it to the Elite Eight last year. It was unfortunate they lost to Duke. But don't forget, Gonzaga is just one of those teams that, that, wears the, that wore this, the original Cinderella slipper. They won that. And we've seen other teams go on and make long runs where Gonzaga was expected to. Teams like George Mason and... And, and other teams of that sort, Wichita State made it to a Final Four. Let's not forget about VCU and Butler. Butler. We still haven't seen Gonzaga do it yet. So I think that they just, <laughs> it's flat out, they have to win their conference tournament. I don't care what it looks like. They might be going to the Final Four. They might meet Georgia Tech there. It's just going to be the they, Final Four up in New York City. That is true. Madison Square Garden. It's unfortunate, but true. Last at-large resume. 41st in the RPI. You are 24-8 and eight overall, 16-2 and two in your conference. Uh, you got one top 50 win. You've got uh, four top 100 wins. Talk about Wichita State. And Wichita State, who uh, you know won the Missouri Valley regular season, lose to Northern Iowa today, 57-52, a, uh, a pretty uh, surprising win there, surprising loss there, I should say, uh, in the conference semifinals. What's their at-large prospects? I think that they I – would, I wouldn't put them in. I, I wouldn't put Northern uh, – I'm sorry, Wichita State, and I'm explaining to you why. One of the reasons being when you lose to a team – like Northern Iowa, and I know Northern people want to give Northern Iowa so much credit because they beat Carolina and they beat some other top teams earlier on this season as well, but you lost to them twice. This is a Wichita State team that started off maybe preseason ranked in the top 10, maybe top 15. Now we're talking bubble. That's where I was talking about earlier a little bit more. Like we have to hold the eye test to be somewhat accountable of some sort. And I know we can't just go off of that, but we also can't make excuses. I think that this is a team that's good enough with some of the losses that they have, the poor losses, that this is a team that's capable of winning games outside of Fred Van Fleet, in which he was hurt earlier on in the season. I think they started out maybe like 1-4 and four or 1-5 and five to start the season or something like that. Of course, they got the ball rolling a little bit. <laughs> But it's a much improved league as well. Evansville is a, is a, is a very, very tough team in that league. Does well. their name, their NCAA tournament pedigree in recent history give them a boost? I know it's not supposed to happen, right? Right. I but the selection committee's human. It'll give them a boost. Now, in the same token, I don't think that they'll get the boost that Syracuse could get, but I do think that they get a little bit more of a boost, and we'll see if it works out in their benefit in their favor. All right, Deshaun, it's a fun time of year, buddy. Yes, 92.9 The Game, 92.9thegame.com. You'll see, hear, and read plenty of Deshaun tape.